Hello and welcome to this third video on the causes of focal dystonia and how to treat them. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name's Ruth Giles. I've spent many years treat successfully treating and curing focal dystonia, especially in musicians. Um, and it's, it's what most of my practice is now dedicated to. So in my last video, I talked about the influence of the autonomic nervous system on, uh, on the, the body and the, the dystonic symptoms. And I was really delighted by all the comments that I received on that video. So thank you so much for the, for the, for the questions, for the comments on that. And so I really decided to dedicate this video to answering some of those. I'm not sure I'll be able to answer all of them because they were quite diverse, but at least some of them. Um, because it's to do with there are there are a couple of key, really key themes that I want to that I want to highlight today. One of them is the difference between neuro neurophysiology and this approach that I take, which is an approach around uh, the neurophysiology of the symptoms and psychology. And and what I want to give is is my in. My definition, which is a very practical definition of the difference between the two, it's not it's not a definition textbook definition, uh, but a really practical level. It's what I observe is is happening in in either of the cases and what's really going on there. So at a practical level, when we talk about psychology, we're talking about connecting to the emotions and from the neocortex trying to understand those emotions the cause of them, trying to learn how to manage them. Um, and there may be emotions, memories, difficult circumstances that we live through. Uh, and they normally have a verbal aspect to, to dealing with them, you know, so we put them into words either for ourselves or for another person and uh, try to work through them from that place. Okay, now that's valid. However, whether the where those memories are stored in the brain is very deep. So it's way, way below the verbal center, which is up here. Okay. Um, and then there's another aspect that we need to understand, which is if we divide the brain into these two levels that I often talk about, which is the neocortex, so the new part of the brain, the thinking, the conscious part of the brain, where we form our thoughts, ideas, our objectives, our opinions, um, our likes, our dislikes. It's where we understand things. It's where we make meaning around things. And that's all the part, all the part that's conscious that we're aware of. Um, and then what we've got sitting below that is the subcortex, which is this very deep part of the brain, which is where we normally don't have access to. Now, um, and you know, I've talked about the, the neocortex working on 10 to 60 bits of perceptual information per second and the subcortex working on 11 million bits of inf uh, perceptual information per second. What's particularly important to understand is that the stairway between these two levels, if you imagine a house, you know, the ground floor and the first floor, the stairwell between the ground floor and the first floor is mainly only in one direction, meaning that it's mainly from bottom up. So what do I mean by that? What's going on in the deep part of the brain, so the neural networks, the neuronal connections that are going on in the deep part of the brain go up to the thinking part of the brain. It affects the way we think about things, the way we feel about things. It affects uh, our opinion about things. It affects our belief towards things. It affects our conscious relationship towards things. Without us being aware of that, it just that just feels normal. You know, I find people who have lived through adverse events often have a very overdominant neocortex. So there's this need to, or, or this, the, the neocortex becomes overactivated in terms of we think a lot, uh, we think through things all the time. We need to think about, understand, analyze all of the time. Okay. On the other hand, the, the stairway from top downwards is very, very, very limited. Meaning, by thinking things through, by understanding things, by rationalizing things, has very, very little effect on actually changing the neural networks that are deep down in the brain. 
And that's really important because it means that if, by making a, psycholo a psychological process for something that's so deeply rooted in the brain, such as focal dystonia, is very limited. Which I think is partly why so often people feel f so frustrated with this difficulty and feel like there's nothing that you can do to resolve it. Because in a way, from that conscious level, there is very little that we can do to resolve it. So what's going on then in that deep part of the brain? So if we want to talk about neurophysiology. Um, so I talked about this overactivation of the nervous system last time. In, and a lot of that comes from adverse events that we've lived through um, during our life, very often in our early life. And it can go right back to when the brain starts to be formed, which is whilst we're in the, our mother's womb. So... What happens, that, so those adverse events, uh, what, what's, what's my way of defining adverse events? Adverse events are an event that's happened to us where we haven't had the emotional, mental, or physical resources to be able to handle that event, to be able to resolve it. You know, and that can be anything, you know, it's, it's not about the size of the event. It's about our ability to handle and resolve that event when it happens. And then there's another aspect of it, which is the accompaniment that we had during that event. So, for instance, there are people who have, had, have experienced a very tra traumatic event, but because um, immediately following that event, they were really well accompanied. That actually hasn't been installed as trauma in the same way as somebody who's experienced something that from the outside looks much less traumatic but they had to handle it on their own. So what happens when we've had adverse events in our lives and we haven't had the, the adequate accompaniment through those adver adverse events, the brain is really unable to store those properly in a fully integrated way um, as they would every everyday events. And they become uh, encapsulated in the brain, when there's this sort of like this dissociative barrier around that capsule. Now, the brain does that so that it doesn't keep tripping over itself all the time. However, there is this, what I talked about, the neuroception last time. There is a neuroception that is constantly coming out of that capsule to look for anything that uh, might indicate that a similar event is going to occur again. And if that happens and that capsule opens and it's as if our brain is actually back there then rather than right here now. If there are significant numbers of those adverse events or the adverse, event is, adverse events are significantly big, what happens is the nervous system just stays on a sort of alert all the time, which is what I talked about as, as that um, sympathetic nervous arousal. So what we need is methods where we can go right into the neurophysiology of the brain so the uh, where those neural networks are encapsulated and be able to very gently but very profoundly enable the brain to be able to rewire them to integrate them fully into the brain so that that so that there isn't this alert going on any longer and so when also something is reminiscent of that event there is no longer this opening of the capsule and this triggering uh, response to it. So that's what I do with brain spotting. Now, in terms of focal dystonia, I've really adapted brain spotting in a very, very specific way to, to be able to do that. Um, you know, and I've talked about, I talked about in the last video that w one large part of the work is about enabling the you know, going into exactly where the brain is being activated so that we can release that off. Um, and, you know, as I say, the brain is supposed to adapt to a very, very specific way for musicians and a very specific way for the dystonic symptoms because it is quite a unique um, expression in the body of adverse events in, the, in life. Um, and then the other, the other really important aspect of that is the accompaniment that, 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 that you that you get when you work with the brain you know, work with somebody through the brain spotting because 
it activate you know when you actually work with somebody rather than working through it on your own that actually activate activates a free free the prefrontal part of the brain that enables that whole process to occur in a in a much more accelerated way so i talk about that because um you know there are quite a lot of comments around flow states and yes it's really important for us to begin to develop um the neurophysiology of flow again i'm going to go back to that so what so what we're doing is we're connecting into the neural networks where those flow states exist and and we strengthen them and then we strengthen them to such a such an extent that they actually become a more naturalized way for 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 you for your in your neurophysiology meaning that the, the brain will redirect to those neural networks in uh, as as its automated way of being. However, we need to deactivate these other neural networks first, because the brain is always going to predominate survival over um, beautiful well-being experiences. So if those uh, neural networks of adverse events are still there it's very difficult to develop on a sustainable way the flow states it takes a long time it's sort of like really kind of walking against the current in order to do that the most accelerated way is to release and reintegrate the adverse events first and then just in itself the nervous system is actually almost automatically in flow and there's nothing that's going to be pulling you out of the flow states on a constant basis. And then from there is where we can actually tune into the neural networks that create flow and in a very accelerated way, make that um, a, a really um, deep integrated part of your everyday experience. And it's not just when you're playing your instrument. It's about making that your everyday experience in, in everything that you're inter interacting with. Um, so for me, it's become, I've seen over and over and over again, that the dystonic symptoms are not re are related not only to activation in relationship to the instrument, but they're also related to your active, the act level of activation that's going on on a, on a day to day basis. Um, and in fact, just this week, I've worked with a couple of clients really specifically on that. And what they found was that as they went into their, their everyday um, activation, you know, in work or family situations, that they actually started to become aware of of how their fingers were pulling in a different way from when you know, at the end of the session where they were able to experience those everyday um, what would be what would have been everyday tensions, but actually had no. Um, but they're actually in peace and well-being in relationship to them and had a different relationship to those day-to-day -day situations, they suddenly found that their hand didn't have that same level of tension in it. And the hand was actually completely relaxed. So the pulling had completely gone. So um, this isn't just about your relationship to your instrument. It's about your nervous system minute by minute, day by day in, in your everyday life. So I really hope that that's answered a number of, of the comments that that, were, that um, you shared with me. Um, in my next video, there are some other aspects that I that that I haven't answered today, but I don't want the videos to be too long. Um, but there were also comments, and that's to do with the whole relation interrelational attachment issues, um, the, those types of adverse events, and how that has a very very deep impact on the, the motor the motor skills be it on the embouchure and and in the hand and and this sort of and the dystonic symptoms that can come out of that so once again thank you for listening to me thank you so much for your comments please do keep keep them up because it really helps me know to know what to talk about and what might be useful to you um, and I really, really encourage you to keep exploring how to bring your nervous system into well-being um, and that we can keep this conversation going. And as always, I say, you know, if, if anybody uh, out there really would like to connect with me, please go ahead and do that. This is my absolute passion. Um, as well as my work, it's my absolute passion. And I just desire 
well-being and uh, beautiful music for all of you. Thank you. Bye.